Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, and thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Willie Goldsmith, and I'm a senior associate with the LentFest Ocean Program. For those of you that don't know us, the LentFest Ocean Program is a grant-making program that funds research projects and expert working groups to address priority science needs facing ocean and coastal decision makers. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit us at lenfestocean.org, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. And you can also follow us on Twitter. We are at Lenfest Ocean. For today, we're thrilled to have with us Dr. Stephanie Green and Dr. Natasha Hardy of the Uni University of Alberta and Dr. Larry Crowder of Stanford University's Hopkins Marine Station. They'll be introducing a new study that will examine how alterations in food web dynamics under climate change could be used to predict the future distribution of albacore tuna in the California current large marine ecosystem. We at LENFEST are really excited about how this project and the application of this new approach, which is called traits-based modeling, could enhance distribution forecasts for albacore as well as potentially for other species. I also want to mention that the research team includes several collaborators at NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center in La Jolla. While one goal of this project is to be useful for informing future cross-jurisdictional management approaches, uh, we do want to clarify up front that this project is focused on the science of how climate change may impact albacore distribution, and the researchers won't be making direct policy recommendations. Rather, we hope this work will enhance the dialogue between managers and stakeholders by shedding some light on how the species, the al distribution of albacore uh, may change moving forward. So before I turn it over to Stephanie, to Natasha, and Larry, I just want to go over a few logistical items. Uh, first off, as you may have noticed, we have all attendees muted uh, just because we have so many folks on the line and don't want to have any feedback or echoes. Uh, the research team is going to speak probably for about 30 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have some time for questions. And if you do have a question, you can submit it at any time using the Q&A panel to, to type and submit your question. Uh, we'll keep track of the queue and we'll read it aloud at the end um, for the research team to answer. And of course, depending on how many questions we have, we may not get to all of them, but um, folks are welcome to follow up with us here at LENFEST or with the researchers. In our closing slide, we'll have everybody's contact information um, available, and we really hope you, you reach out and let us know what you think. For next steps, we are recording this webinar, and in the next couple of weeks, we'll make the recording with the video of the PowerPoint available online, and I'll distribute that link via email. I have a running distribution list for information about the project, so you've hopefully been receiving emails from me, um, but if you haven't, or if you're not sure if you um, are on the list, uh, just shoot me a note, wgoldsmith at lenfestocean.org. So uh, I lastly want to mention that we'll be live tweeting today's webinar with, under the hashtag GC webinar. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stephanie Green. Steph, I'm now going to transfer presenter privileges to you. My name is Stephanie Green. and. Um, what we plan to do in about the next 40 minutes is just provide you with some background of what has sort of led to this project, um, introduce some of the concepts and questions that we'll be working on, um, and hopes that it would stimulate future conversations and feedback from all of you who are on the line today in terms of the utility of the approach that we're proposing to take and also give you an idea of what the phases of work might be for this project. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alberta, uh, up in Alberta, Canada. But our project team is uh, made up of individuals from a number of institutions at this point, and we're hoping that uh, collaborations on this work will grow, including Dr. Larry Crowder at Stanford University, uh, Natasha Hardy, who's on the line, a postdoctoral scholar shared between Alberta and Stanford, uh, who will be presenting today as well, and then close collaborations with Stephen Bograd, Mike Jacox, and Elliot Hazen, scientists with NOAA at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. The focus of our project, as Willie introduced, really is on trying to develop science-based tools that will inform our understanding of how ocean ecosystems are going to respond to global uh, changes imparted by stresses like climate change, for example. And the one thing we do know about uh, climate change going forward in our oceans is that, that things are going to change. Um, so this is just a, a key result from a paper that really sort of stimulated my thinking about uh, what our future oceans might look like as we have intensifying warming um, and changing ocean conditions across all of our ocean basins. So this is a study that looked at species redistribution based on thermal tolerances of a wide variety of species found in our global oceans. And here what we see from the map is that areas with sort of the intense blue colors are areas where we're likely to lose a number of species, so have species richness decline. 
And areas where we have hotter colors or sort of more uh, intense colors are places where we're actually going to gain species richness. So we'll have species shifting their ranges to um, meet their sort of environmental conditions and as a result, essentially have ecosystems and communities that will be um, pulled apart and put back together with new combinations of species. As an uh, ecologist and a scientist, um, we are really sort of um, in a bit of a conundrum with how to best understand where species will change their uh, ranges, the rate at which it will occur, and ultimately what this will mean for the structure and function of ocean food webs and the resources that we derive, the important resources we derive from them. And so there are a number of initiatives going on globally, I'm not going to review all of them, to try and uh, create quantitative models that can help us predict where and when species will change their ranges. So, um, for example, in the California current system, which our research team focuses on, there are a, there are a large number of groups uh, focusing on trying to understand how ocean species use habitat within, within this area of the Eastern Pacific, how environmental conditions uh, have changed in the past and will change in future, and what we might then infer for predicting species redistribution under future climate scenarios. So for example, a study by our collaborator, Elliot Hazen, uh, looked at pairing tracking data for a number of top predators in the California current system with uh, knowledge of changing environmental conditions in the Eastern Pacific over past decades, and then used that, uh, those data sets to infer how the ranges of these predators might shift going forward in the next 100 years. So in particular, um, looking at intensifying warming in the Eastern Pacific, and then looking at how the known uh, habitat use of these predators based on matching with things like um, with thermal data might actually shift going forward. Uh, studies like this have found that actually ranges are likely to shift substantially going forward, and there's a lot of variation and uncertainty about the magnitude of those shifts based on what our climate ultimately does going forward. Um, but there are likely also to be major implications for the abundance and distribution of these species, many of which are, are important for a number of reasons, including that they are commercially harvested all along our coast and, and our global oceans. In particular, uh, species like albacore tuna, uh, Tunis alalunga, are incredibly important recreationally, culturally, and commercially as fishery species. They occupy sort of the pelagic realm in, in the Eastern Pacific. And uh, in this project, we're really interested in how species like albacore might be responding to um, climate shifts that are coming our way, and ultimately what that might mean for their distribution and the consequences for, for fisheries that are dependent upon them. Albacore tuna are distributed globally, so they're not obviously just found in the Eastern Pacific. And this is just a summary of, of some information on sort of the uh, caps of albacore globally in metric tons. But what we're really focused on while albacore are distributed and fished globally is um, what's going on in this portion of the Eastern Pacific and the California current system for which we have uh, a fair number of data sets from which to build an understanding of how ranges might change. So for example, the North Pacific population of albacore um, use the California current system in the Eastern Pacific for at least a portion of their life cycle. This is just some tracking data showing one of the many sort of movement and habitat use patterns for albacore tuna in the, in the California current system. And so often young albacore will, uh, will migrate to the Eastern Pacific where they're accessing prey resources up and down the coast and also interacting with fisheries that operate there. And of course, when albacore tuna are in the Eastern Pacific, uh, they're accessed as a resource by a number of different uh, fisheries across many different jurisdictions. So this is just a figure showing with the different colors um, approximate catch by different nations over time of albacore tuna um, in the North Pacific. And um, when we are thinking about specifically the California current system, catch is shared between Mexico, the U.S., and Canada, and the rates and magnitude of that vary from year to year. And so one of the things that we are really interested in, uh, both as ecologists but also ecologists who want to build tools 
that are relevant for helping to understand how things might change is how will albacore distribution and abundance respond to climate change going forward in the Eastern Pacific? And how can we develop quantitative tools that might help to inform um, what we might be able to, to say about where distribution and abundance might shift? So some of the common approaches to predicting species distribution from sort of an ecological and, um, and environmental science perspective often involve understanding how species have been distributed under past environmental conditions, and then inferring where those species might be based on our knowledge of predicted environmental change. So for example, tagging and tracking studies can help us to build pictures of how species use habitats in relation to environmental conditions such as temperature, chlorophyll, um, acidity, and many other sort of basic ocean conditions. What we can do is look to the past at how species have used habitats in relation to those features, and then look forward by coupling distribution models with projected change in those same variables. This common approach, though, um, assumes that species might closely respond just to the abiotic uh, drivers of environmental habitat. And so within these approaches, often what we're not able to account for is how important resources for these predators might also be shifting, such as prey species. So one of the key components that, that might not be captured in some of these modeling efforts is how prey are responding to these same conditions and what that might mean ultimately for predator redistribution and abundance. A number of emerging modeling techniques help us to, uh, to start to couple and flesh out the importance of prey resources and their shifts for predators. In particular, a number of different platforms to create complex ecosystem models where we essentially would try to um, account for the abundance and distribution of various prey resources that are accessed by a predator and then uh, look into the future at how those prey resources might shift and what that ultimately might mean for um, the interactions between our predator focus and, and the prey resources that are important for them. One of the sort of uh, modeling frameworks that is growing in its application to, to try and understand how forces like climate might influence species distribution is a large complex framework such as the Atlantis ecosystem model. And this is just a schematic of how this sort of complex framework which aims to try and understand important dynamics all the way from climate and oceanography and abiotic environmental conditions up through the food web and then ultimately how species are connected to uh, fisheries and other resource use to try and create um, predictions of how shifting either the base of this model, so changing oceanography, or changing, uh, for example, fisheries might alter um, species abundance. Um, our team is particularly interested in one of the key sections of models such as this, but there are many models of, of this type, and that is all of these lines collecting different components of the food web. So each of these connections is actually a predator-prey connection that tells us um, who is eating who within this ecosystem? I'm not going to go into the details of the equation, but essentially it's the strength of interaction or the proportion of a particular prey type that a predator is consuming. Knowledge of these interactions is critical because it tells us how um, biomass is flowing through the food web. And the main way we tend to flesh out all of these really important linkages is through gathering diet information from predators. So we go out into the field, we gather uh, our, our species of focus, and we do, for example, stomach contents analysis, and we under to understand what types of prey they might be feeding on. Um, what, there are a number of key challenges for trying to infer feeding links from things like stomach contents, even though it really is our main tool at this approach. The first of which is that it's really a snapshot of what a predator might be eating, and it's often quite disconnected in time and space from the conditions that a species is currently um, facing. So we may have to use diet data from several decades ago or a different place to try and infer these important predator-prey relationships. It's also really expensive and uh, time-consuming to collect stomach contents information, often because 
predators have highly digested prey in their stomachs, and so we need a really large sample to get an accurate snapshot. And also, we're just capturing what the predator has consumed and not necessarily accounting for what, what was out there for them to eat. And so it's not necessarily possible for us to understand whether a predator is being selective or not from, from these diet data. So a key question that our project wants to try and address is how can we account for changing feeding relationships when we're predicting the future distribution of predators like albacore? Given that the data we have right now to understand diets and predator-prey um, interactions is uh, often fairly limited, and that the distribution and abundance of prey themselves are going to be responding to stresses like climate change, how could we try and predict what, what might happen going forward in sort of an absence of, of information uh, situation? So I just want to spend a few minutes diving into a totally different system that sort of provided the inspiration for how we're approaching this question and, and why we're focusing on albacore. Um, I want to take you away from a temperate pelagic systems and instead to coral reefs where um, insights that we've gained from a, a totally different predator that was changing its range helped us to sort of think uh, through an approach to this question. So many of you on the call may be familiar with, or maybe some of you aren't, the rapid invasion of Indo-Pacific lionfish across the Atlantic Ocean and, and Caribbean basin. This is an incredibly beautiful, ornate uh, predatory fish that's native to the Indian Pacific Ocean and has been causing an unprecedented invasion in an, a new ocean basin over the last decade. Uh, Atlantic coral reef systems are where I have a large background uh, in terms of looking at food web interactions, and it was studying this invasion that sort of inspired the approach that focuses on species traits that we're now applying to albacore. So lionfish have actually invaded over 7 million square kilometers of marine habitat in the Western Atlantic, and all of this has happened within the last 10 to uh, 20 years. And as the invasion has spread, there's been major concern about what the impacts of this new predator would be on populations and the diversity of native species in the many habitats that lionfish now occupy. As the invasion was expanding, um, we were uh, getting more and more diet uh, studies or snapshots of what lionfish were eating. And it, it wasn't really surprising that as lionfish continued to spread, uh, scientists were finding more and more uh, native species within their stomach contents because the species that they are encountering on these habitats are incredibly variable. Uh, reef fish communities differ between North Carolina versus Cuba versus the southern coast of Mexico. And so um, from these diet data, we weren't really able to get a handle on which species were likely to be most impacted because the list was just an ever-growing, ever-growing number. But what we really wanted to do was to be able to look ahead of the invasion front and identify which species might actually be likely to most strongly interact with lionfish, and therefore where we might want to allocate management resources for things like population control, for example, of this invasive predator. And so instead of just looking at uh, summit contents to look at the list of species that were there, we wanted to actually ask which species are most vulnerable to lionfish as predators and bring in aspects of foraging ecology to try and gain general insights into what was driving which species were showing up in the diet. Uh, when we think about the foraging process of any predator, there's sort of a number of key stages. So the first of which is that a predator must encounter a prey type in the environment, and that encounter has to lead to an attack and a successful capture, and then ultimately consumption of that prey resource. And um, there's a growing body of literature out there that points to characteristics of both predators and prey that help us to understand success at these various stages. And so, um, for example, from the predator's perspective, Things like the habitat uh, position or use of the predator um, influences the prey it would encounter with. The predator's body size would influence which prey it's likely to attack, and how it actually attacks prey might 
uh, influence whether or not that was a successful capture. And equally, from the prey's perspective, there's a number of characteristics, both morphological, behavioral, nutritional, that are likely to influence this process. And so what we did was, instead of thinking about the taxonomy of particular prey species, we thought about the suite of traits that species might possess that would make them more or less vulnerable to lionfish as predators, and use these traits to try and predict what types of species, regardless of their uh, taxonomy, would potentially show up most often in the diet and would therefore be most vulnerable to being consumed with, by the predator. So just to give you an illustration of a couple of the key traits that were most important in the context of uh, invading lionfish um, interacting with native species in, in the invaded food web. Um, body size, for example, and shape were two characteristics that were incredibly important in predicting which species the predator would consume. So for example, the blue colors here um, denote areas of the sort of shape size uh, space where species would be highly uh, preferred or selected by lionfish predators, and the yellow colors are areas where prey were really invulnerable. So what we found was that small, narrow body species were most likely to be consumed and were really vulnerable to predation, whereas other species that were more deeper bodied and larger in shape weren't often not consumed based on um, their relative abundance. And it wasn't just morphology. Size and shape are two characteristics that we know well from a number of systems influence consumption in, in marine food webs. But we also found that behaviors were really important. So for example, uh, habitat use by different types of species was a really strong predictor of who would be um, consumed, so where those really strong predator-prey interactions would be. So what this knowledge of traits allowed us to do was to look beyond just uh, the set of species that had shown up within the diets of lionfish across their whole invaded range to say, if we look beyond this particular invasion front, we look to the future, where might there be species that are most likely to be impacted by this invasion using this set of traits that we know is important. So for example, we identified species like the social wrasse in Belize, which has a really restricted geographic range, and all of those morphological and behavioral characteristics that we know are most vulnerable to being consumed by this predator as its range changes. So this was sort of an initial application of this traits-based foraging approach to understand where strong predator-prey interactions might emerge in the case where we have species where ranges are shifting quite rapidly. And unfortunately, biological invasion is not the only driver of range change uh, in our global oceans. It's, it's just one of many stresses that are pushing the abundance and distribution of species outside of where they have uh, historically been. And of course, climate change is one of the other major drivers that's shifting species ranges. And so uh, the main goal of this project is to try and apply this traits-based thinking to understand where strong interactions uh, between predators such as albacore tuna and prey might emerge as species ranges are changing. Um, and then to be able to, uh, to create quantitative tools that uh, have been tested by looking back in time with data sets that already exist to, to understand the importance of traits and then to look forward to try and uh, create predictions of where species might go and how abundant they might be based on these incorporating these interactions. So I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Natasha Hardy to talk a little bit about our initial work applying this traits framework to albacore tuna and their predator-prey interactions to give a taste of, of what we know about albacore tuna as predators, um, some of the analyses that are behind the first phase of the project and where this project is intending to go over the next couple of years. And um, so, Tash, I'll hand it over to you to take from here. Thanks, Jeff. So in the next slide, we, um, I'll just get the next slide, please. Awesome, so we are focusing on albacore tuna because their diet is highly variable and diverse across their range and over time. Um, but we typically focus in the literature on key species trends that are 
by nature taxon and location specific. Um, we also have lots of data available for past climatic shifts throughout the El Nino and La Nina climate oscillations, um, here in the California current system especially, as well as longer term data sets dating back into the middle of the last century, uh, for example, for prey availability through NOAA. Um, Albacore are economically important species with shared jurisdiction between the US and Canada, and we expect their range between these jurisdictions to shift under climate change. Next slide, please, Steph. So I'll just get the next slide. We have um, so far in our project identified over 100 species in the diets of albacore tuna in the California current system, extracted from studies dating back to 1949 and until the early 2000s. And we've heard anything from comments that tunas will eat um, anything that fits in their mouth to comments naming um, or you know papers naming one or two key prey items that potentially influence the distribution of albacore. Um, these include forage fish, pelagic cephalopods, and crustaceans. I'll have the next slide. Next slide, please, Steph. The diets of albacore tuna um, in the California current system were reviewed by Sarah Glazer, and they're pictured here for the energetic contribution of common prey items to juvenile albacore that are found in the California system, California current. Um, Glazer corroborated the findings of previous studies that identified zories dominating the diets of albacore tuna in the California current system from the 40s into the 50s. And then from uh, the 60s, 80s, and early 2000s, um, there has been a switch towards anchovy, hake, and other forage fish in their diets. And in the 40s and 50s, those years were known to be, um, to be particularly abundant for sori, and um, anchovy and other forage fish were known to be low. So in the next slide, um, we can incorporate information from um, existing knowledge on prey spatiotemporal habitat use to make sense of diverse diets of albacore tunas. This is illustrated um, from a study by Valerie Elaine, and she simply illustrates different groups of prey in tuna diets, um, coloured here for their um, depth, uh, pelagic habitat preference, and style migration behaviour. And that information um, on prey spatiotemporal habitat use can be integrated with next slide. next slide, please. Yeah. Can be integrated with knowledge the one before, yeah. With knowledge on where and when predators have been caught, as in Jock Young's et al. study, um, a large study from the Eastern Pacific um, on multiple predator diets, they've combined information both on what we know about prey habitat use, so um, from prey identified in the diets of these pelagic predators and information on the catch time and depth of these predators to classify niche separation and overlap in these predators as they illustrated here. So it's a very simple um, but effectively a trait-based approach. And so adding a spatial temporal dimension to this, sorry the slide before, um, so adding a spatial or temporal dimension to this kind of image, we can use that to identify potentially if something, an image like this could change, and for a particular predator, if foraging patterns or strategies actually appear to change over space, time, and life history. And as an example, we may ask of our data if we may see more mesopelagics in the diet of albacore or other groups. Um, and so we know that diet, diets of albacore vary across geography, time, and life history, and in changing climate states also in the next slide. We, so we aim to investigate diet shifts over historical and recent climate regimes to predict shifts under future climate scenarios using additional trait information on top of taxonomic information. Um, and we can use um, traits such as morphological, nutritional, behavioural, habitat use traits to help us make sense of high taxonomic diversity in predator diets um, because within taxonomic diversity there is uh, likely to be trait redundancy and we can find potential indicators for past and future change in food web. So, you know, no question or no hypothesis could be whether traits in the diets reflect their availability in the prey community. And pictured here is a theoretical ecological trait space for the prey community in navy and um, the predator diets in the lighter blue. These polygons 
Uh, shapes are essentially going to be determined primarily by weighted morphometric trait information and um, be including other traits um, in those calculations as well. Um, that's using a morphometric uh, morphospace analysis approach. And in this case, we've illustrated just two polygons that would um, essentially represent a non-selective um, diet in the predators selecting from an existing sort where the traits in their diet reflect an existing trait space. Um, and if we imagine that across changing climate regimes, um, where changes in the prey community could either be, um, in this case, in the, in the row presented, reflected in the predator diet. So again, this is a, a non-selective diet within a community of available traits. And in a, an additional row of polygons, we have um, pictured our working hypothesis, which is that there will be some measure of selectivity in the traits present in the diets of albacore tuna across climate shifts, where they may be switching prey taxonomically, but still selecting traits that are advantageous either nutritionally or that confer um, advantageous habitat overlap between predators and prey. An alternative hypothesis to these two would be that we would see shifts in the diets of albacore tuna across climate shifts that may fall somewhere between these two rows of polygon, where we have some level of trait selectivity, um, but where rather than just those static triangles, there would probably uh, likely be a change in that shape as well. And just how well that diet predators polygon reflects the prey availability polygon is uh, one of our main questions, um, just conceptually. And so for the Lens Based Ocean Program, we'll be profiling important predictive traits for shifts in the diets of albacore tunas in relation to our best knowledge of prey availability and in relation to historical and future climate regimes. For that, we are currently using published data sets, just like this table here. And we're also inviting collaborations with those who have raw albacore diet data that they might be inspired to share by this um, webinar. Because we ideally do, um, we could benefit greatly and our analysis would be enhanced from raw data um, at this stage. It is, uh, we're working with published data. Though. And what we would do with that data in, um, is we are proposing to apply multivariate statistical tools to identify key trends in predator diets that also include in the box in the top right here is our species predictive traits, as I've mentioned, morphometric behavioural, nutritional and spatiotemporal habitat use traits. And in the left, um, that would be combining the analysis with information on prey um, prevalence in the diet. We'll be probably focusing on biomass, um, but other metrics can be used if they are available or the only ones available. Um, and we combine, um, we want to combine that information using fourth corner analysis with explanatory variables for the environment. And a fourth corner analysis is simply a solution that was published by Alexandra Brown um, that integrates information from multiple arrays mm -hmm. of uh, data and to perform hypothesis testing on, um, in our case, how ecological community can be explained by that added information, in this case, species traits. And conceptually, in the next track, using a fourth corner analytical framework, we can compare multiple models, such as the deviance explained, this is hypothetical here, but we would ideally um, compare the deviance explained by a trait-based model compared to a taxonomic model um, compared to the sum of a hybrid model of both um, a trait and taxonomic model. And there are many applications uh, out there for the corner approach and um, other approaches such as Stephanie's presenter just earlier that illustrate the power of trait-based approaches in describing and predicting changes in ecological communities. Um, and in our case, we are aiming um, to use that, and we suggest that it would be great if we could come up with, um, using this method, predictor traits for prey species assemblages in the diets of albacore that would perform as well as a taxonomic model, if not better. What our output um, would look like in the next slide um, is our models will generate output um, in initial phases that look like this, where we are hypothesis testing, significance testing our array of traits against 
um, a, I guess the species prevalence matrix and our explanatory variables for time and space. And this uh, method enables us to identify strong positive uh, or negative correlations as well as non-significant relationships between um, traits in the diet of albacore tuners in relation to their environment. And we can apply the same model um, not just using um, prey prevalence in the diet, but prey prevalence in the environment as well and compare those models to get at selectivity um, and prevalence comparison in diet versus environment. And so from that we can find out what traits may be more important or correlate strongly with environmental conditions. And our model is transferable and scalable, not just from albacore in the California current system, but to multiple pelagic species and ocean um, basins. We are working on a basin, basin scale analysis of trait-based predictors at the moment for pelagic predator diet assemblages, focusing especially on albacore tunas to frame the patterns that we will be identifying in the California current system. And so again, we invite collaboration from folks around the world with available tuna, albacore tuna diet data, um, if interested, to contribute to a global meta-analysis of predictive traits in albacore diets. So in this early phase of the project, um, I'll be identifying strong predictor traits to project for future diet shifts in albacore tuners in relation to changing oceanic conditions that are causing food webs to shift in space and time. And conceptually here is, is what we mean by predictor traits. There may be traits that are conserved um, and those are strong predictors. There may be traits that have no relationship um, to the environment um, and they don't explain variation in the diet. And then there may be traits with hypothesis as there will be that are going to help us understand shifts in space and time and capture variability in the diet above the taxonomic um, variation. So this is um, the first phase of our project and that will feed into downstream food web modeling. And I'm sorry, I'm going to hand it over back to Steph who's going to wrap this one up. Thanks, Tash. Um, so Tash gave a really, I think, rich illustration of the first phase of the project, of which you know there's three major phases and, and with three overarching goals for the project. The first of which we are of which we are just in the in the early stages of now is characterizing the trait basis of foraging interactions from past data through global syntheses and multivariate analyses, um, and applying that to the California current system. But from these insights about you know, the extent to which traits play a role in these interactions, the second phase of the project is to modify existing food web model architecture based on um, trait-based foraging interactions rather than just taxonomy alone. And then the third phase, once we have this uh, revised model, is to test its performance uh, in terms of reconstructing distribution and abundance from past uh, data sets and then ultimately using the model to look forward to understand as both the distribution of potential prey for albacore and albacore itself are shifting in response to future climate scenarios, how might those interactions mediate changes in the distribution and abundance that we may see going forward. Ultimately, this is an additional tool that we hope to add to the toolbox um, so that scientists can help to uh, create sort of more robust pictures of what ecosystem change and species distribution change might look like going forward. And so a key phase of this is comparing output from this approach to other both single and multi-species models um, that are being created in this particular system too. So this is a three-year project. We just started at the beginning of this year in 2019, and so we are very much in uh, phase one. And we look forward to uh, engaging more with this community. We'd love your feedback on the approach and your insights and, and potentially involvement if, uh, if some of you are interested. And we also have a couple of additional years to continue working through the approach in the other phases as well. So with that, I would just like to thank all of you for your attention and welcome any questions from those of you who are on the line. Thanks very much.
I think, I think Willie, perhaps you were going to moderate questions, but you might be muted. I'm going to turn the presenter controls back over to Lenfest. Hello, can folks hear me now? Okay, great. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I had muted myself. Um, <laughs> uh, what I had said was uh, thank you, Stephanie and Tasha, for that, that great run through. And my apologies for, um, for folks not hearing me there. And yes, if you could type your questions into the queue there, uh, I will read them aloud. And um, as Stephanie said, um, pass them on to the research team now for them to answer. Um, so let's see. I think first question here is looks like a great project. Just curious. Are you planning to use Atlantis for your past future food web and distribution projections or other kinds of models? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's certainly one of the modeling frameworks that we have considered, um, uh, you know, working with. There are a number of others we've, we've thought about potentially, you know, iterations of Ecospace or even initially something a little bit more simple um, that's coded through sort of other network modeling means. But it's, it's certainly something that we are, you know, a, a major application for, for modeling system dynamics and so something we'd love to tinker with. And I think that's perhaps just a little bit down the line as we have more conversations with folks who use that tool um, and, and develop it. Okay, great, thanks. Um, there are a few folks who are asking if they can ask their questions verbally, and I just want to reiterate that because we do have so many folks on the line, um, we're going to stay to written questions for now. But if you if you do want to, if you have a longer question, we can certainly um, address that after the fact. So um, apologies, apologies to those folks. Um, one other question: I think this type of work may be more revealing with other species rather than tunas, as with the albacore and other tunas, uh, given that the key to their distribution is often considered to be um, excuse me, key to their distribution, relative abundance, and catchability is water temperature, oxen, oxygen, turbidity, uh, chlorophyll, and other environmental impacts. So I guess it's, it's sort of a question to clarify um, how you think uh, these food web dynamics may enhance these, these forecast distributions. I'm happy to start on that, and then Tash and Larry, um, if you want to add anything to that. You know, it's, it's interesting. We, um, I guess that is a major question for us, is to what extent might most of the variation be explained just by abiotic drivers, um, or does adding, you know, food web information through this approach really give us any more insights into what's happened, at least in the past, um, with previous information on distribution? Our sense, just given um, the breadth and sort of diversity of diets that we've seen in albacore tuna, is that um, you know, we selected the species because there's some interesting variation, but, um, you know, it, we'd love any insights and whomever asked the question has, we'd love to hear those and um, have more conversations about it. And we do realize that this is an approach that could probably be, we hope, applied across systems and, you know, not just for tuna. So if there are suggestions for other systems in which this might be something to try, we'd also love to hear more about that. Yeah, I'd like to jump in. This is Larry. Um, yeah, I think that the question is really appropriate um, because a lot of the distribution analyses have been done have been done for um, fish distributions relative to remotely sensed environmental variables um, without directly considering food availability. Um, and, uh, you know, variation around business as usual as long as the predator-prey interact interactions are the same would probably be driven by the environmental variables. But if the predator-prey interactions change in terms of which prey are available in the, in the physical environment that's most appealing to tunas, uh, could have a big effect on tuna bioenergetics, especially given the energy demands that tuna experience. So I think the, the questions are really appropriate ones, and we will be trying to nest this new approach, the traits approach, 
in the context of all the previous work that's been done to understand habitat distributions of these animals. Great, uh, thanks Larry and Steph for that, that explanation. Um, our next question is, you have applied this traits-based framework to both reefs on lionfish and the pelagic environment with tunas. Are there any considerations of how we might need to modify the approach based on habitat type as you think about generalizing across the systems? And I might add to that as well, um, the differences in approach for a invasion-driven distribution versus a climate-driven distribution. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. It's something that we think we are thinking quite intensely about. Um, and again, we're, you know, I think the piece that we're really excited about in this project is to sort of bring foraging ecology theory into the food web modeling space in potentially a, a slightly different way. And so, you know, the, the um, steps of the foraging process and the characteristics that are going to be important are, are very different between reef and pelagic systems and, and many other types of systems. And so um, while the general framework in terms of thinking about that foraging process and the steps of encounter, attack, capture, and consumption are consistent, the characteristics and the features of those environments and how they modify interactions are going to be really different. And that's where working with um, system-specific experts to identify what those really important um, traits and characteristics are both their predators and prey, and how the habitat modifies those interactions um, is, is sort of key to this. And where we hope, at least from the pelagic realm, that, that strong interactions with individuals who um, work specifically on tunas and in foraging ecology of pelagic predators will, will help to make the framework application robust in this environment. Great. All right, our next question. I was just going to add one oh, yeah. brief thing. Please. Brief. Um, just in the different systems uh, for uh, reef versus pelagic, I think a lot of it comes uh, back to the conceptualization of these questions and projects. The, the analyses are totally transferable. You have, uh, you know, for example, traits on nutrition that occur in any animal in the world and any plant. So that's transferable. It's the question that, it, that obviously is going to be specific and tailored to what we want to know. And as I think Roger Mitchell has been asking about or mentioning in uh, these questions, um, that there are important environmental drivers uh, that affect the distributions of pelagics um, and perhaps less so with reef species. And so that does frame our questions differently. However, we do know that uh, juvenile cohorts of albacore do hit the California current system and they are it is described to me, um, they are often associated with prey aggregation. And so I can't imagine that we can discount that and that um, I've been told they are even known to disappear when the prey disappears. So that's very telling that there's a trophic component to this, um, just addressing, I think, uh, Mitchell's question and also saying that, yeah, again, the, the approach is transferable. It's about how we apply it, really. Uh, yeah, Larry, if I could add one more thing. Um, the, the complication with any foraging model, or a big one, is uh, estimating encounter rates. Um, and and that's, a, that's a problem for Atlantis and for Ecopath Ecosim as well, uh, is trying to figure out which prey are available and detectable by the predators. In a structurally complex habitat like reef systems, uh, the encounter rate profile is really different in the open pelagic systems and may be somewhat more amenable in the open pelagic systems than in a habitat that's structurally complex. But uh, getting at encounter rates is, uh, is such, always a challenge. Great. Thank, thank you all for, for walking us through those, um, those, those different approaches here. Our next question is, thank you very much for your presentation. This is very exciting and fantastic work, and I'm looking forward to following the study. I would like to ask if your modeling might be applicable to marine spatial planning processes, especially MPAs. Um, I can take a stab at that question. So, um, you know, one of the, uh, I think, major components of this at the end of the day is, and of many modeling efforts, is to create um, tools that uh, generate spatially explicit predictions. And so, you know, in the context of thinking about spatial planning and, and marine protection, um, 
having a spatial element to the analysis is obviously very key. And so um, certainly we envision that the output that will come at the end of this project in terms of the models that, that forecast distribution and abundance will be spatial. And so, you know, the output from those could certainly be taken up in a number of ways and, and thinking about what shifts might might occur to inform spatial management might be one of those ways for sure. Um, I'll just add to um, obviously Shari must have enjoyed Steph's um, case study on lionfish. I've got an unpublished case study at the moment on uh, recovering predators in southeastern Australia. Um, they were they are fur seals recovering adjacent to marine protected areas and so there's um, they forage coastally and um, also in pelagic ecosystem, but our application and our surveys indicated that there weren't, um, at, from both taxonomic and trait-based perspective, there weren't strong changes in the communities adjacent to first year haulout sites at this stage, and that was early in the recovery of those predators. So this approach was used in the context of predator recovery, um, our design couldn't test for marine parks, but marine parks worked with us and um, they were keenly interested in how a predator could affect species assemblages. And with the analysis that I've uh, described to you guys here, we can get at, um, and with Steph's analysis, we can get at understanding what traits might confer vulnerability to species in the face of a, a recolonising predator, for example. So that is one question that this is extremely applicable to, but there, there are definitely others. I just thought I'd add that. In case you're interested, I will hopefully publish that this year. <laughs> great. Thanks, Sash. Uh, we have a bunch more great questions here, so we're going to keep going through. Uh, we may not get to everything, but we will be passing along um, any questions we don't get to to the research team. So I want folks to keep that in mind if they do have additional questions. We have a lot of great ones here. Our next question is, your work concentrates on long-term shifts in climate and oceanography. How applicable is this work, sorry, how applicable is this work to predicting interannual and shorter-term shifts in predator-prey relationships and catchability? It's as applicable as the data have detail, actually. So I'm currently using um, published data, which means my replicate is a study. Um, and so I guess this comes back to we're also inviting collaborations because um, if we have finer scale data across uh, finer temporal scales and spatial scales, then we can get at that. Um, yes, we can also, with our current data, look at interannual and shorter term shifts, but probably not uh, shorter than uh, within the year, basically. Yeah, and, and I think Tosh showed the data for the variation in diets um, since the 1940s. Uh, and we know some of those periods when the data were collected were El Nino years and one where Others were La Nina years, and so one advantage of actually doing this work in the California current is we have high variability in the ocean environment on a year-to-year -year basis with that ENSO cycle and also with PDO. Um, so in a way, the water that we're trying to make these estimates for is doing experiments for us all the time, which we hope will provide insight for the longer-term changes. So I very much think the approach is applicable to shorter term, and that's usually the data we're working from but we're trying to stretch out that timeline further into the future. Yeah, and I guess I want to probably uh, put out a general thanks to the people in some that have uh, are probably no longer with us, but responsible for these long-term data collections that we're using. It's, um, I think that, yeah, this is a real plug for using long-term um, data set and to continue long-term monitoring of things like diet and prey availability. Great. Um, next, we have uh, not so much a question as a as a comment from a uh, from a stakeholder. And the question and the comment rather is: We are struggling to accurately represent the British Columbia albacore tuna fishing data in spatially explicit MPA planning processes. We know where the tuna were caught, but not necessarily where they may be caught in the future. So I think that certainly um, you know outlines some of the significance of this work for uh, potential management considerations moving forward. Our our next question is this project seems to share some of the same goals as the Future Seas project currently underway at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and other locations. How closely will the two teams, both the research team um, speaking today and the Future Seas project, coordinate their activities? 
That's a great question, and and thank you for that because we didn't explicitly mention it in our in our webinar yet. Um, but you know, one of the uh, key things when we were deciding on a, a system and a case study to try out this approach was conversations with with those who are behind the Future Seas project. And as you'll probably have noticed, Mike Jaycox and Stephen Bograd and Ellie Tazen are are collaborators on this project, and so. Um, so there is close connection and, and dialogue between that project and, and this one in that we see it as a real opportunity because there are a number of different types of modeling that are, that are going on through feature seas and that albacore tuna are one of the uh, species of priority where we might be able to compare, for example, output from this type of traits-based modeling approach against a number of other types of models that would emerge from, from that project, single species and multi-species models, um, coupled to regional ocean models that are being updated to sort of leverage that collective modeling power to, to try and understand how we can best capture the variability um, within the system and, and look to what might happen in the future. So, so integrating and um, communicating with that project was was certainly one of the key advantages that, that we saw with having this project happen in the California current system and also to partnering with folks within future seas. Great, thanks. All right, last, a uh, couple more questions here. This question, uh, great presentation and thank you. I think you mentioned this builds on the future seas project as, as we've heard. Um, Actually, I guess you guys sort of already elaborated on the connection here. So uh, we can actually skip ahead um, to our last question now that I um, have gone through that. Uh, our, our last question is, what is your hope and vision regarding the use of this, pro of this project's findings to inform fisheries management? Yeah, I can, I can take a start. And again, Larry and Tash, feel free to jump in. I think, you know, as an ecologist, um, and an ocean scientist, we are really struggling with this question of what is going to change um, going forward as climate climate changes intensify. And so, you know, the goal of this project is to see whether or not we can create a quantitative tool that helps us to better capture um, some of the variation that we've seen in this particular ecosystem and and uh, species distribution, and then think about what that might help us to say about how things might change. And so. You know, essentially what our hope is is to create a, a spatial model that can help us to understand in complement with a number of other modeling techniques that are out there um, where species might go and, and how their abundance might shift. And so, you know, we envision that, you know, that question of where things will go and how abundant will they be is, is on everybody's mind on this call. And so trying to come up with science-based tools that, that in, you know, shed some light on that is, is our hope. How those outputs are used, um, as we've heard on the call, there's a sort of myriad ways that they might be taken up by the folks who are actually making decisions and, and looking at a suite of options, but, but our hope is just to provide an additional source of information for those, those conversations. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in too, Steph, thanks. Um, I, I think what we're envisioning is, you know, everybody recognizes empirically we have species on the move out there, and people are doing uh, statistical analyses to relate those uh, range expansions to the north in the northern hemisphere to environmental variables and looking at rates of movement and things like that. Others are using uh, food web models that are taxon based. Uh, others are relating the, the predicted positions of animals 10, 30, 100 years in the future. But most of those are correlated to uh, remotely sensed environmental variables, and we know from first principles ecology that where the organisms are likely to be is also driven by their access to food. Um, and you can model that with taxon specific approaches if the prey types are going to be the same in this new system. But as, as Steph said at the beginning, uh, as these systems pull apart and reassemble, uh, we're imagining that the predator prey interactions are going to lead to novel. Uh, relationships where predators are encountering prey they haven't seen before, prey are encountering predators they haven't seen before in their recent evolutionary history. So um, we, we're hopeful that this will provide insights for spatial management within 
uh, the U.S., but also maybe considerations of shared stocks and those kinds of issues, which are really important. Um, we're, we're working closely with the regional managers and with NOAA and so on to make sure people are aware that this work is in the pipeline, and we hope that it will turn out to be useful to make a more robust management decisions going forward. Great. Thanks, Larry. And I think that's a, a wonderful high-level note on which to end today's webinar. It is 4.01 uh, Eastern Time, so I think we're going to wrap now. Um, but thank you uh, to our research team, um, Steph, Larry, and Natasha, for presenting today. And thank you all so much for listening in today. Um, again, uh, if you do have any further questions, feel free to email me, wgoldsmith at lenfestocean.org, or members of the research team whose email addresses are listed here on this closing slide. So thank you all so much again uh, today for, for tuning in, um, and feel free to follow us at, at, at Lenfest Ocean on Twitter, and continue to stay engaged and in touch with us um, for this and our other projects. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day.